I've said it multiple times, the Sega Genesis is not a system I'm super familiar with. I even did a Best Genesis Games I've Played video a couple years ago, and I had Rocket Knight Adventures as my favorite Genesis game. I also had Mystic Defender and Miss Pac-Man on the list, and while those are good games, come on, they're, they're not the best games on the system. After playing a number of games since then, I have a new favorite. I really do want to cover the Genesis more on my channel. And I figured to help make up for it, I'd enlist a bunch of YouTubers to make one big giant Genesis collaboration video. So everybody brought in their favorite Genesis games. Well, mostly their favorite Genesis games, but we'll get to that later. SPOILER ALERT! SPOILER ALERT! There are no Sonic the Hedgehog titles on this list. He's MIA because I guess these other games are better. Don't blame me. Blame my contributors. Before I get to my favorite game, we're going to go ahead and show everyone else's first. And to get things started, I wanted to introduce YouTuber turned Twitch streamer Emmett Despain from Rom with a View, also known as Utah Punk. And he's going to show us his favorite Genesis game. Sega does what Nintendo don't. Thank you, Emmett. That was... interesting. When I initially set the rules for this video, I told people that duplicate games were fine. It's fun to see what one person has to say about a game versus what another person has to say about it. And everybody pretty much decided to try to choose a game that no one else had chosen, except for Nefarious Wes and Pam. Thanks guys, you guys just ruined all of it. You just ruined the whole thing. No, I'm just kidding. It's really actually kind of cool to see how two people homage a game differently, so check it out.
Hi, I'm Pam from Cannot Be Tamed. Though I didn't grow up with the Sega Genesis, of the games I have played on it recently, there's one that sticks out. It's an exciting spaceship shooter with a kick-ass soundtrack. It's Musha. Musha is a vertically scrolling shoot-'em-up, developed by Compile and released in 1990. It tells the story of a rogue AI who wants to rule the solar system and is about to attack Earth. Compile makes my favorite shooters, and this is another great one. It's a bit different in that rather than getting to choose from a lot of different weapon or bomb types, you have control over the formation your weapons take, and can choose from between 8 different speeds. Musha really shines in boss fight design. One of the first is a moving fortress, which looks extremely cool. There are a number of face-shaped ships you have to fight, which have great-looking effects, along with more mechanical-looking bosses that have a lot of moving parts. There's even a boss that attacks you with a whip in one of the more visually impressive sequences. As far as levels go, they all look great and unique. I'm particularly partial to a segment of the game that takes place during a lightning storm. It lights up the sky, turning everything you're fighting into shadows against the brightness. Musha does an exceptional job of having a lot of visually interesting things happening around you without obscuring hostile projectiles too much. Though it can be quite challenging, I never felt like it was unfair. I also have to mention the game's amazing heavy metal soundtrack. It's some of the best 16-bit music out there. And now we're going to beat people up because that's probably the most fun thing to do, right? In video games. In video games, not in real life. And so to look at some bare knuckle action from the same series, we have Michael B. and Dan from Console Wars. Hi everybody, Michael B. the Game Genie here. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to Tony asking me to participate in this video. What is my favorite Sega Genesis game of all time? I, I'm going to be honest with you, I was surprised because I, as soon as I read this, I thought I knew exactly what I would pick. But I kept going back and forth from a game that I only recently in the last couple of years fell in love with compared to the one I've always been in love with. And when it came right down to it, I had to stick with what I knew and what I loved. That is Streets of Rage on the Sega Genesis. What can I say? Streets of Rage has always been my favorite game on the Genesis. And I guess the easiest way to put this would be, I used to not own a Genesis at first. All my friends had the Sega Genesis, but I didn't. The only way I'd get to play it was there was a convenience store down uh, at the end of my road that used to rent out the Genesis. So every weekend, it was like 10 bucks, I'd rent out a Genesis and I'd rent out two games. While one game would always switch out, it'd either be Sonic the Hedgehog, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, uh, Spider-Man and the Kingpin, something like that. There was always one game I would rent with it, and of course it was Streets of Rage. Why I loved it so much? It was the first time I ever felt like I had that arcade experience at home. I mean, the graphics were beautiful, color was vibrant, it was just so much fun to play. I, I especially loved the street scene in the background, like you can see it while you're playing along, like the cityscape going in the background. But also, right in the opening, I mean, watching the city go across while that, you know, slow, somber Yuzo Koshiro tune played. It was just amazing. And I talk about the arcade experience. What I used to do, and this is kind of crazy, was I used to just leave my system running and just let that intro play over and over again. And I'd walk into my room, and it gave me that experience. You know what I'm talking about when you walk into an arcade and you see the machines just doing the intro over and over again. That's what I felt like coming into my room, seeing my Sega Genesis on, and Street Rage playing in the background. And we haven't even gotten to the game yet. The game is just fantastic. I love the music. I love the way it plays. It's, it's just amazing. I can't say enough good things about it. I know some people are going to say, oh man, how can you pick Streets of Rage? Streets of Rage 2 is so much better. And 
you know, I just like Streets of Rage 1 more. Maybe it has to do with the fact that Streets of Rage 1 is just a little bit harder. I find the difficulty more set to what I find enjoyable. And on top of that, it's kind of more grounded in reality. You don't fight weird aliens in a swamp, so I like that. Anyways, I won't bash Streets of Rage 2 anymore. Streets of Rage 1 is my choice. It's my favorite Genesis game of all time. It has been since I've been a kid, and still is today. My favorite Sega Genesis game is probably Streets of Rage 2. I know it's not the most original answer, but I really have a lot of nostalgia for that game. I mean, I loved the first Streets of Rage game, and the second one just blew it out of the water in every category. So, you have the graphics, I mean, the characters were just bigger, the animation was a lot smoother, the levels, there was more variety, then you have the music, I mean, oh, that soundtrack, too. One of my favorite soundtracks of all time. I still remember when I was a little kid, just like, going to the options menu, just listening to every track, and I had to listen to it on the headphones, that's right, because any cool soundtrack on the Genesis you had to listen to through the headphone jack. So I remember doing that a lot with this game. Just such a good soundtrack. Even the sound effects, like just when you hit a person with a pipe, that What a satisfying crunching sound effect. Oh, I love that. And the gameplay was improved too. I mean, now you have more moves, you have the special move. Grasshopper! Grasshopper! I always thought I'd say grasshopper. It just felt tighter. Just, ah, oh, just such a fun game to play. You know, you play by yourself, you can play with a friend. You know, I remember back in the day, um, since I was an only child, the person I played with the most was my mom, because she was a pretty big gamer back in the day. And she didn't always want to play the game, so I'd have to convince her, and I would convince her the only way I knew how, and that was by crying my eyes out. So, a lot of crying to get my mom to play this game with me. But it was worth it, because when I played with her, I could beat it. I mean, just such a fun game. You know, you just feel like winding down from your day, you just pop it in, beat up a bunch of dudes, I don't know what else to say about it. What can I say that hasn't been said? It's such a good game. And that's why Streets of Rage 2 is my favorite Genesis game. One thing people tend to forget is that the Sega Genesis has a lot of RPGs. Like, seriously, I thought the Genesis was a cool kid console. Nobody likes these nerdy RPGs. Hey, 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 hey! Take that picture down, please. Please, please take that picture down. Please take that picture down. I stop, stop. You're you're ruining you're ruining the whole thing. You're ruining my image, editor. Who's also me. Anyway, sometimes it's easy to forget to include the Genesis when talking about 16-bit RPGs. And to kind of help correct that, we have Kevin, Andrew, Tim, and Mr. Elucidator himself. set on a desert planet of Mutavia, where you take up the role of two hunters, Shaz and Alice. The story starts off small, with them hunting monsters, before it moves on to spanning multiple planets in the Algol solar system. It's all heavily inspired by Dune and Star Wars, with sandworms and spaceships. You fight mutants and magic wielders, with fantastical elements existing alongside science fiction, a rare thing at the time. It's also packed with anime style cutscenes as well as loads of flavor text that help build the world in ways that the limitations of the time could not. The awesome pixel art intro you see when you're now starting out with Alice and Chaz overlooking a town sparked the imagination in a way that hasn't really been matched in most modern games. And uh, I'd rather play with Alice than Ryder any day. I mean as, play as. This is my original copy of Fantasy Star. As you can see, Sega spared every expense in producing this, with high quality black and white manual and cardboard box, free of non-biodegradable plastic. And the wonderful quality assurance doesn't stop there, as they promised an incredible adventure on the back. 
They prefer to spend that cash on the actual game and it definitely shows. The encounter rate is high but the journey through the worlds, music, story and art direction come together to make a game that is far greater than the sum of its parts. Now if only we'd get Fantasy Star 5, or a new Panzer Dragoon game, or Skies of Arcadia, or Comic Zone, or Vector Man, or Outrun, or Streets of Rage, or Virtua Fighter. Hey everyone, it's Andrew from Retro Island Gaming. Now, I love role-playing games on the Sega Genesis, but since I'm late to the Brazzle party, all the good games got taken. So, let's see what else is in the box. Ah, yes, a classic from 1989. Welcome to Sword of Vermilion. Long ago, the King Sarkon unleashed his evil hordes upon the peaceful land of Excalabria. The town failed to control the invaders, and it became obvious its demise was imminent. The King of Excalabria, Eric V, gave his infant son to his most trusted servant, Blade, and commanded him to escape to safety. Reluctantly, Blade took the prince far away and raised him as his own son in a new village. It's been 18 years, and now, lying on his own deathbed, Blade informs the prince of his true identity and destiny to exact revenge on King Sarkon and rescue this world from his corruption. The world is dotted with villages, much like the one the prince grew up in. Each town has numerous buildings like equipment shops for new weapons and armor, inns for recovery, and fortune tellers for the curious. The citizens offer useful advice, but the best are the ones willing to part with the map for the overworld. Instead of the 2D sprawl of the towns, the overworld is a 3D maze through forest and mountains. Having a map makes travel so much easier, especially with all the trouble the prince will encounter in the wild. The invading forces terrorize the pathways between towns. Be prepared for quite the combat spectacle as the prince defends himself amongst a bizarre mess of charging slimes and kobolds. Caves are usually found near a village, connected by a plot device to help move the story along. For example, the King of Parma will ask us to retrieve the treasure of Troy to prove our worthiness of his Ring of the Sky. The caves are mazes like the overworld, but require a light source to see even a couple steps ahead. Exotic loot can be uncovered, but expect tougher enemies defending the darkened halls. Upon finding the treasure of Troy and returning to the king, the prince gets a lesson in deception as the king decides not to offer his ring after all. Why don't you just forget about the ring and settle down for a quiet life here? <laughs> Boss battles occur at a rare frequency, but when it does happen, it's a fight to the death. The prince lowers his helmet's face guard and draws his sword. The massive bosses have the upper hand, so prepare to outwit and outmaneuver their dominating presence and fight your way through Sword of Vermilion. Alright, Barassel, let's talk about Shadowrun. Released in 1994 from Blue Sky Software, Shadowrun is based off of the pen and paper role-playing game of the same name. It's a cyberpunk RPG that takes place in the dystopian future where magic has re-emerged into the world. This results in parts of the human population transforming into orcs, elves, and other magical creatures. All races now have to coexist on the same planet together with a handful of megacorporations controlling just about everything and everyone. The game puts you in the shoes of Joshua, a man who's come to Seattle to investigate his brother's murder. Arriving into the city flat-ass broke, you'll first need to source some money in order to buy back your brother's belongings and start searching for his killer. And in this world, whether you're a man, troll, orc, or cyber-enhanced amputee, if you want to get anything done other than get robbed or shot, there's only one option. Me. I then go back to the house 
of that woman's mouth. That I never could find. You'll start by choosing one of three job classes. You can sleep in motels to raise your stats using karma points that are earned by completing shadow runs. And deciding which stats you choose to build will greatly affect your gameplay experience. And this is actually one of the most interesting things about Shadow Run, the flexibility in which you can approach the game. Want a higher paying corporate infiltration job and have a character who doesn't know dick about computers? Just hire a Decker to join you on the job. Hell, maybe even hire a Gator Shaman for that extra muscle while you're at it. Don't know where to get the best jobs and weapons in the game? Pay a Johnson to give you some new contacts to call in the vid phone to hook you up. Shadowrun is unlike anything else you'll find on the console, and over time, it's become a personal favorite of mine. If you want a great RPG for the Genesis, just love the cyberpunk genre in general, or have at least a passing affection for the lawnmower man, Shadowrun is absolutely worth seeking out. Last time Brazzle asked me to pick up my favorite game on the NES. This time he spiced it up and asked me what my favorite game on the Sega was. And while I do have many fond memories of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, there was one title that, like Ultima 4, helped direct my gaming preferences toward the RPG genre. The game, of course, Shining Force 2. I had already played one, but two really stuck with me. Besides the fact that I was a blonde kid and Bowie also is a blonde kid, and I kind of connected with him on a spiritual level because of that fact, it's essentially just a visual and mechanical overhaul of Ultima 4, so it's no wonder I liked it. I chose 2 over 1 because of a few things. The music in 1 was very drab and repetitive. The music in 2 has much better direction and hosts some of the happiest music in an RPG I've ever heard. And it's not just that, it's also composed much, much better than its predecessor. Although it still suffers from being repetitive, the jovial tune of is way more tolerable than the dry staccato and since you hear music 100% of the time, the volume is up even a little bit, that's kind of a big deal for me. Besides music, I also feel like the game is much more bold in its color scheme, placing together interesting color combinations, like when you upgrade Bowie to the hero class, he's wearing red, blue, green, white, and yellow. All of those are really intense when you pair them up together. I also thought it was cool how his hero class is sort of an homage to Max from the previous game. Speaking of upgraded classes, there's nothing I love more than being able to see your army grow. You start off as just a handful of kids, but by by the end of it, you're all battle-hardened veterans. Even Sarah's showing off those legs and kicking ass by the end of it. Of course, she could also become a vicar too, but I always like to think that she gains some serious confidence and just starts taking names. These kinds of upgrades are probably one of my favorite aspects of any game, especially for a game like this where you spend more time battling than you do in story. You kind of get to make up your own story in between all the battles. While I'm talking about it, I might as well just gush about how cool the character designs are. Like, isn't it cool how Kiwi starts as this little turtle monster and then becomes this Shining Force version of Gamera? Or how your centaurs could be long range or short range, and depending on what you promote them with, they can become like three different classes. There's also Zink, who's a freaking ancient automaton that's all mysterious and shoots lasers out of his arms. Or when you get Geralt and he's this weird looking Swiss Alps guy, and you're like, eh, I don't know about this guy, but turns into a full blown freaking werewolf when he's promoted. As far as the story is concerned, it's decent, but the delivery isn't the best. I couldn't tell you if the translation was bad or what, but everyone sort of feels like the same character. Good Good guy, bad guy, I could show you a line of dialogue and you could slap any portrait up in the corner and it would fit them to a T. But because of this problem, you get these sort of funny scenes where, like, Astral, who lives next to and presumably studies this ancient tower, goes, Hmm, what a mysterious tower. I wonder who built it. And later on, where Creed just says, I understand you, and tells a kid that he's just staying with them because he says so. I know the narrative doesn't want it to seem that way, but come on, when you say, Adler will remain here, then get in his face and say, Won't you, Adler? <laughs> That's creepy as hell. At around the time this scene happens, you also run into a weird mid-game halt on everything where it's just battle after battle after battle with nothing to break it up and really poor conveyance as to where to go a lot of the time, so it's pretty easy to get burnt out about halfway through. And oh man, let's not get into the last scene too much. I actually, you know what? I'm just gonna leave it with this. That scene could single-handedly explain why the support system and romances are a thing in Fire Emblem. And that's it. That, that's all I'm gonna say about it. Despite those shortcomings, the game has so much charm that I can overlook every single one of them. Between all the characters you can get, the places you go to, and the situations that you get in, the game always has some way of scratching that fantasy itch. So that concludes everything. I hope you enjoyed it, and like last time, go out and play this. It's like chess, but really charming chess. I mean, just, just look at Mei. 
Look at her. She's so f***ing cute. How could you not play this knowing that something this adorable is in it? Now go get it. Why does everyone just sit there after I tell them that? Oh, what? Is it, is it because you think you're better than me or something? Because I'm a cartoon and you're real, like you don't have to listen to what I have to say? Is that, is that it? Is that the problem? Well, I mean, if that's the... Hey, who, who are you guys? Bra Brazzle? Brazzle? Is that... Get, get off! Brazzle! I'll get you for this! You can't keep me locked up forever! The first thing that comes to mind for me when you talk about the Genesis is action games. Shooting, hacking, slashing, ass-kicking, platforming action games. And of course, there's a healthy helping of that here, courtesy of Sarah, Adam, Joe, Will, and Ace. What do the colors orange, yellow, green, blue, and red have in common other than being an awesome part of the pride flag? Well, they're all characters in one of my favorite games for the Sega Genesis. As you know, I'm an avid Mega Man fan, and I love a good shoot-em-up, and this is no exception. There are multiple difficulty levels, um, easy, normal, hard, and expert, and it can get pretty crazy. When you start, you have four weapons you can choose from. I'm using the chaser here. Although you are not limited to using just your weapon, you can also slide and dive. There are also multiple mini-bosses in between certain stages, and they can be anywhere from really hard to really quirky and fun. The gameplay changes up throughout the game. For instance here, I really love the minecart idea. You have to jump from wall to wall or up to the ceiling even to attack your enemy. This is one of my favorite bosses in the game, and he has multiple forms, but I'll let you find them all out whenever you actually play it. So, weapons. You have multiple weapons to choose from, and you can pick two and combine them to make an even more powerful or more useful weapon. They, of course, all have their own utility and are better in certain situations. Each stage has something different to throw at you, like this silly dice maze. You roll the dice and fight different enemies until you finally get to the end, where you fight black. Yes, most of the main characters are named after colors. The game at times can be brutal, even in easy mode, and this sucks. Having to do this maze again, it takes so freaking long. The game is full of weird quirks like, this guy, let's fight him with love, love, dancing. Hey look, it's Bison from Street Fighter. If you haven't, you should definitely check this out. The game's only a dollar on Steam. A dollar. Or you can try to collect the game. It's well worth it, and I highly recommend it. Hey, what are you staring at me for? Go watch more video recommendations. Go! Go! Although it's often considered one of the toughest games in the series, Contra Hardcore is easily also one of the best, making it a no-brainer as my favorite game on the Sega Genesis. Hardcore is essentially a high-octane boss rush with minimal time in between for popcorn enemies, and every single encounter is well-constructed and completely beatable with even your basic machine gun once you learn the patterns. The standout quality of Hardcore, however, is its variety and options. There are four characters to choose from, each of which have their own physical capabilities and a unique arsenal of weapons to rip aliens apart with. Ray offers a classic set of weapons, complete with a spread gun and homing missiles, while the bionic wolfman Brad Fang has a roster of guns that are devastating at close range. Each character also has a slide that damages enemies and grants some invulnerability to the player, allowing you to get out of a tough situation. That's not it for variety and options, though. Throughout the game, you're presented with a few choices regarding stage selection. These levels have completely different bosses, challenges, and endings, giving you a lot of freedom with respect to how you progress. There's even a weird secret ending that I won't bother spoiling. My only issue with Hardcore is that it's limited by the Genesis controller, 
Selecting your weapon and anchoring yourself for stationary angled shots can be awkward and may lead to some frustrating deaths, but it can be mastered with persistence. Factor in the blistering pace of the gameplay, the solid and cohesive art style, and a soundtrack that takes full advantage of the grinding metal sound provided by the Genesis audio chip, and you have an amazing and challenging action game that will keep you playing over and over. Plus, you can play as a fucking bionic wolfman with shades and chain gun arms. If that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. Hi, I'm Joe from On The Stick, and I know Brazzle wants us to talk about our favorite Genesis games, but somebody's already talking about Gunstar Heroes. So instead, I'm going to talk about the game that sold me on the Sega Genesis. You have to understand, when I was a kid, the NES was it. And I don't just mean for me, but for all of North America, basically. Video games were NES. Period. I knew one person who owned a Master System. And when the Genesis came out, most of us didn't really know quite what to make of it. But a friend rented one from the video store along with a copy of Strider, and that made me a believer. Put yourself in my shoes. You've never seen Strider in the arcade. You know Strider to be, well, this. An interesting but super glitchy game with awesome music and merely adequate graphics. Then your friend rents a Genesis, and you expect mostly the same, but you get this. An interesting and not at all glitchy game with awesome music and awesome graphics and awesome gameplay with fantastic controls. And while it turns out it's really short, you don't know that because as a kid on a rental, you can't beat it. Strider changed my whole world. I'd gone from Space Invaders on the 2600 to Super Mario Bros. on the NES, and now Strider. I'd never seen this game in the arcade, but I'd seen other current arcade games, and I knew that these were arcade quality graphics. Or at least I felt like they were. Well, whatever, I knew they were a lot closer than whatever the NES was getting. And while I wouldn't own a Genesis until after I eventually got a Super Nintendo, Strider was the game that told me this system wasn't playing around. Sega meant business. So yeah. While it's not my favorite Genesis game, it remains a classic, and it's certainly the best Strider port of the era. If you haven't played it somehow, run, don't walk. Hey guys, I'm Will, and one of my favorite Sega Genesis games of all time is Shinobi 3 Return of the Ninja Master. And this is a true sequel, a true beefed up sequel to Revenge of Shinobi. And just starting off with the music, I just want to get this out of the way, but I much prefer the music in Shinobi 3 than <laughs> Revenge of Shinobi, which I know is heresy to a lot of you people. Uh, from what I understand, Yuzo Koshiro didn't do uh, Shinobi 3, but um, <laughs> my god, the music is just wonderful. You have Whirlwind, which is one of my favorite tunes of all time. Uh, any 16-bit generation game, I absolutely adore that theme. And yeah, the gra graphics look wonderful. I especially like the, uh, the, the level 3 when you're in the laboratory, the, uh, the flickering lights going on and off. I really like that. Especially like the bosses, especially the uh, under the underground, the tunnel uh, monster, where you're basically fighting uh, Pizza the Hut, but he's like uh, like m like <laughs> Stay Puft Marshmallow Man size. He's huge and gross and grotesque, and I I always thought he looked really cool. And menacing. Control wise, this game handles better, I think, than uh, Revenge of Shinobi because you can, as in that game, you can double jump, but you can also run. You can do run attacks. You can block this time right from the get go. Uh, you can jump off of walls, you can hang off of ceilings, you can do dive kicks off of enemies. This game, I mean, this game has you covered in, in terms of speed running or just speed in general. This game for rocks. You also have your Ninpo magic, you've got the fire one, you've got the one where you explode yourself and cause massive amounts of damage to enemies. You also have the shield and the one that makes you jump really high. So all that is covered and all that's really cool and fun to use. This game is great, it looks great, it sounds amazing and it's a lot of fun to play. There's some tough... It, it, it's a pretty tough game. It's not as... It's not as hard as Revenge of Shinobi. I feel Revenge of Shinobi is a little bit tougher, but all in all, this is the total package. If you were to play one game in the Shinobi series, I dare say you should only have to play this one. It's Shinobi 3, Return of the Ninja Master, Sega Genesis. It's a must-play, must-own. One of my favorites, so... 
back to you, Brazel. Thanks a lot for having me, and take care. Hi, I'm Ace from Samurai Pixel Cats. Anyone who knows me knows I absolutely adore the Sega Genesis. So when I saw the call out for this collaboration on Twitter, I just had to jump on it. But now comes the hard part. How do I choose just one favorite to talk about? Ha! Bet you thought I was going to pick Sonic, didn't you? Nope. When I try to think of a good, not Sonic example of what the Sega Genesis experience is, I think of Vector Man. Vector Man was basically Sega's answer to Donkey Kong Country. Developer Blue Sky said, yeah, the Genesis can do pre-rendered graphics too, and we can make it faster and more action-packed. And this game is definitely all those things and gorgeous to boot. Vector Man is a blast to control and has a lot of really cool moves. Like, not only does his rocket feet give you a double jump, it damages enemies too. And for the truly daring, it is actually the most powerful attack in the game. He also has a total of six weapons, four of which are his main blast attacks, and the other two are a short invincibility power and basically a screen nuke. And he can also grab short transformation power-ups that can help you reach secret areas. The gameplay is super solid, but let's talk about how freaking awesome this game looks. Vector Man himself looks great with that smooth animation, and his green color just pops off the screen no matter the setting. And the backgrounds are absolutely beautiful. Blue Sky did an amazing job with the limited color palette on the Genesis. There's even great little details like how the lighting on Vector Man changes depending on where you are in the level and when you fire your weapon, to little bugs flying around light sources or rays of light coming in through the water and the ocean level, to simulated lens flare in certain areas. Finally, I have to mention the music and sound design. Vector Man has one of the best soundtracks on the Genesis, and is one of my go-to examples when I hear people say the Genesis has a bad sound chip. To this day, I still listen to the soundtrack in my car. And it's not just the music. The sound effects are all punchy and satisfying, and the game makes wonderful use of stereo, so make sure you have a good set of speakers or headphones. Overall, I think Vector Man is the quintessential Sega Genesis experience and a must-have for any Genesis collector. And I leave you with this final thought. Vector Man for Smash. And then you have weird games from weird guys. Like, sports games. Like, games aren't for jocks. Ugh. Just, why would you want to buy a roster update every year? It's so... Hey, stop doing that with the picture. You're just making me look bad. I'm gonna fire you. I'm gonna fire you. Remind me to fire you. Anyway, weird guys. I mean, okay, sports aren't that weird unless you, like, pair it with mutants. And then we have a crazy shooter... A space sim and a funk game? Nathan, Wally, Pluto, and Zack all share their favorite games with us. If I'm being totally honest, Sonic 3 and Knuckles is probably my favorite Genesis game. I mean, how could it not be? Any kid who had a Sega Genesis had at least one Sonic game, and I had all of them. I even had a Sonic and a Tails plushie. But like, Everybody knows about Sonic the Hedgehog. There's literally nothing I could say about these games that you haven't already heard. So instead, I'm going to tell you about Subterrania. I first saw a preview of this game in GamePro, showing off various screenshots. And there was probably an article, but I was like 7, so I definitely didn't care that much to read it. I just liked the shiny pictures. The thing that explicitly sticks out in my memory about that article was the giant, angry, multi-faced demon thing. You look at this thing and think, okay, that is definitely a final boss. Nope. You face that monstrosity on the second stage. The game opens with a really cool looking 90s future guy zipping down the screen and into a spaceship. You know he's cool because he has a crew cut and a ponytail. After that, the game throws you into the deep end, and you have to collect all the sub pieces so you can travel underwater and rescue a handful of POWs. Why are there POWs? That's where the story of this game comes in. Your cool 90s guy doesn't have a name as far as I know, but he does have a job. Blast some alien scum. Aliens have attacked an underground mining colony, and it's up to you to save the survivors and kill some bad guys. That's pretty much it. You can't expect much from a game like this from the early 90s. There's a few ancillary objectives as well, but they mostly break down to get the thing, destroy the thing, or get the thing to the other thing. Because the game takes place underground, your ship is strongly affected by gravity, which you are constantly having to fight against to stay alive. You also have to refuel your ship, watch out for baddies, and try not to blast yourself into a wall. You get one continue to finish all 10 levels, and the game is crazy hard. I've never beaten it, but every time I fire it up, I always have a good time.
The Mutant League series on the Sega Genesis is unlike any other games on any other system. While football hit consoles first, it was Mutant League Hockey that stole my attention. Developed by Electronic Arts and with the same feel as NHL 94, Mutant League Hockey is anything but. While it has some aesthetic similarities in terms of the menus, controls, and the layout, Mutant League Hockey is for the casual sports fan who likes something different, and boy does it deliver. It's hockey with a sadistic twist. Violence is encouraged, and players pick up weapons in an attempt to maim and destroy the opposition. Bloodshed and gore is rampant, and putting the puck in the net is almost secondary. Teams are parodied and franchises are made up of fictional players, though one look at a team like the Lizard Kings shows that maybe, just maybe, there are some similarities to the NHL club of the same name. Gretzky, Robitaille, Curry, Coffee, Huddy. And it's not just the Kings who are parodied. Captain of the 1994 Stanley Cup winning New York Rangers, Mark Messier. Some similarities there too, and he plays for the Derangers. Each team is ranked differently with different strengths and advantages. Between goblins, skeletons, and robots, every franchise has something different to offer as far as 16-bit technology allows. A variety of arenas have different hazards and obstacles such as spiked nets and large craters, or a simple sheet of ice without any hazards or hiccups at all. As players explode, corpses remain on the ice and provide their own issues for players. And like any hockey game, there's scraps. Players fight, get beat up, and are eventually taken away by an executioner. Hell, there's even a skeleton organ player who acts as a referee to drop the puck on face-offs. Whether you enjoy hockey or just want a quick, fun romp, Mutant League Hockey is a great title to pick up and play for short or long playthroughs and is a great game to enjoy with friends. It is easily one of my favorite games of all time and tops on the Genesis. Starflight is freaking amazing. It's a space exploration sim where you jet around the galaxy, look at stuff, talk to fish people, and mine minerals. The sheer zoom my god scaling of this game is mind-blowing for a cartridge. Each of these dots is a star with possibly multiple planets around it for you to land on and dune buggy across. And you can talk to plant people who might not even talk to you if you have lizard men in your crew because of an ancient grudge and ah, there's just so much to this game. It's basically Mass Effect in 2D and I love it. I haven't even talked about the ancient civilization mystery you have to solve or else all the suns in the system will solar flare and wipe out everything so you end up following a breadcrumb trail of clues and ancient ruins and I love this so much. How does one simply choose their favorite Sega Genesis game? The console is just loaded with so many amazing titles. Beat-em-ups in the Streets of Rage or Golden Axe franchises. Shmups like Thunder Force 3 or 4. Platformers like Shinobi 3 or Earthworm Jim. Run and guns like Contra Hardcore or Gunstar Heroes. Side-scrolling action games like Dick Tracy or Batman and Robin. And of course, Sonic the Hedgehog. But my favorite types of games tend to fall outside of any defined genre. Echo the Dolphin, for instance, comes to mind. But in my heart, there is only one game that fits the criteria of my absolute favorite. Not only on the Sega Genesis, but of all time. And that game is Toe Jam and Earl, a funkadelic adventure featuring two hip aliens who crash land on Earth. The game was created in 1991 by the collaborative team of Greg Johnson and Mark Borzanger. Toe Jam and Earl represent kind of a outside satirical perspective on who we are as Earthlings and they kind of are making a statement about, you know, how crazy we are and how self-destructive we are and how self-involved we are and all that kind of thing. That's what all of that silly comedy is really kind of underlying that. All right. 
If you were to classify ToeJam & Earl's gameplay, the term roguelike would be front and center as the game's biggest inspiration came from the 1980 computer game Rogue. This includes 25 randomly generated levels, presence defined and open, as well as a plethora of quirky earthlings to encounter. There were a lot of elements in the game that were sort of roguelike elements, the randomly generated worlds and the open-ended exploration, and those elements are not specific to ToeJam & Earl, but the thing that ToeJam & Earl did was it turned it um, light-hearted and cooperative. And how could I possibly talk about ToeJam & Earl without mentioning the absolutely fantastic Pure Funk soundtrack? Yeah, a lot of the, the way the audio sounded, too, was due to the fact that Mark Miller came up with sampling real instruments in the MIDI. So yeah. it, was, it was you beatboxing into a, uh, a little tape recorder, basically. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. I remember I, I was on some hillside in Nevada walking as I was singing. <laughs> ToeJam & Earl, at its heart, is a multiplayer cooperative experience. It was designed with this in mind from the beginning. And to be fair, it isn't quite the same experience playing by yourself. The very humorous and chaotic nature of the game demands another human being to be fully realized. Still, I think that the real magic of ToeJam & Earl is in the way it facilitates play for people, and the real magic happens kind of on this side of the screen between people as they cooperate, and the, the game has always been at its best when it's being shared. On a personal level, Toe Jam and Earl has infused itself into part of who I am as a person. My brother and I play it most years around Christmas time as a tradition of sorts, both as a nostalgic remembrance of our childhood, but also because, you know, the game is still a lot of fun. The reason for this is simple. Rather than just being sent on a mission from point A to point B, Toe Jam and Earl allows you to play within the game itself. There is no greater gift than that in a video game. And it's the reason, even after all these years, that Toe Jam and Earl is my favorite game of all time. You spend an awful lot of hours playing the games you love, and it happens at a time in your life when you're very impressionable, and some of those memories are really forming, and I guess now, in retrospect, I can see why it ends up meaning so much to people, but uh, I still am always surprised. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, High guys. Five. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you later. Yeah. Aloha. And lastly, we have a game from Rewind Mike, and it's definitely not a Sonic game. This is one of those games I played a ton of when I was a kid. Now, I don't know what happened to the cartridge, it just sort of vanished like things tend to do when you're younger, right? <laughs> that wasn't just me. Socket, or Time Dominator First, as it's known in Japan, is often considered a Sonic clone. It features a blue duck who wears red and white shoes, and he runs fast. Aside from that, I, I really don't see it. Even the stage layouts seem nothing like they are in Sonic. The worlds are split up into three zones. Each one is a bit different than the last. The first zone is generally straightforward. You run through, gather all the electricity bolts, and you charge the time machine? Yeah, there's this crazy story about going back in time and creating some sort of paradox, but it really doesn't matter here. So instead of rings like Sonic, the health bar ties into energy pickups, and kind of feeds into the whole idea of socket and gives the collectibles meaning. When the health bar hits red, it starts to alert the player of low health, at the same time making their ears bleed. You know, for a game trying to copy the Sonic format, it doesn't promote a sense of speed. Sure, you can run fast, but the game loves to place enemies on the path or just block the player from making it up certain ramps. I mean, it is a video game, so there should be enemies, but this wouldn't be a problem in Sonic. All you had to do was roll into a ball. Here, you need to hope your kick attack lands. Best to take it nice and slow with this one, to be honest. The other areas in the game are steeped in platforming goodness. This is where the similar stage designs pop up. 
moving platforms, stage hazards, and multiple layers with more than one path to finish a stage. It really doesn't skirt the obvious inspiration from Sonic's design. Yeah, look at those layers and layers of parallax scrolling. Hmm, maybe this is really just a big Sonic clone now that I'm breaking it down. I can see it now. The bright neon colors, tons of attitude with rad shoes, and a mascot that runs fast, and it's only on the Sega Genesis! I want to thank all of my contributors who helped make this video great. And I, I just really appreciate it because they took the time out of their busy schedules to edit up a bunch of little segments so I could put together a whole video of me just talking in a camera and not having to edit anything so I could have something to put on my channel. Thanks, guys. But before I leave you, I give you my favorite game, Thunder Force 3. Okay, okay, my favorite game on the Genesis. It's not my favorite game of all time. You guys got that, right? Thanks. This game kicks ass. On my recent shmup kick, I picked this game up and sunk a ton of time into it. I had to beat it. Thunder Force 3 has everything you want out of a horizontal shooter. Great gameplay, awesome power-ups, amazing graphics, and intense music. Technosoft really knocked it out of the park with this game. I love how the power-up system works. You can switch between any of the collected power-ups that you have, and if you die, you just respawn right where you were killed and you lose the power-up you were using at the time, rather than having to go back to the beginning of the stage without any of your weapons like in a Gradius game. It's forgiving, but it's also super tough. It just has the best balance of challenge, difficulty, and fairness that I've seen in a shooter. If you haven't played Thunder Force 3, do yourself a favor and play it. And play 4 as well, that game's awesome too. That's all I have. I want to thank my contributors again for a wonderful job, and thank you for watching. Later.